Hi, good afternoon. TFF, THF, and THS 701s. Um, yes, it's today is the 10th of March. It's two days before the week one officially starts, but this is your week one canned recording. Um, this is what you're going to go and click on, listen to, and then there's like a little quiz, which I'll show you now um, on the content of this actual lecture. So good to see you, and I hope you can tune in and you're finding Canvas quite easy to navigate. Um, the study guides for um, TEFF and THF, not the THSs, I think will be available from next week. And that sort of goes along with the week one quick links on Canvas, as well as the recordings, um, gives you a bit of background. Um, THS, I think you're going to get yours in 2025. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you so I can get my PowerPoint up and running. Let's share. There you go. So it's been a very hot day here in PE, um, about half. we've had lots of fires because it's so dry, we really need rain, it's a drought area, but um, it's good to be with you, at least the wind's not pumping this weekend, um, so the west or the east, whichever it goes, um, it's been quite hectic this last week. So let's get to today's canned recording, um, principles for English teaching methodologies, both for TEHF, the FETs, and THS. Um, the SPs as well as first additional language as well. The principles for language teaching, it doesn't matter if you're first language or second language, um, they apply across the board. Um, a lot of the teaching of English and teaching of English first additional language are very similar. Um, we will be doing an extra lecture for TEFF next week on second language acquisition, which is so important for you when you're teaching learners of English. However, in the home language classroom nowadays, many of your students or your learners will actually be second language teachers um, or learners, <laughs> and therefore you would need to make an understanding of comprehensive input and things like that, which I will touch on. So yes, English is fun. That's the best language art. It's the best teaching subject art. And I'm sure you're all very excited, exciting English language teachers. Yes, um, quite an interesting thing by Bianca Herreras. She says, the first step in making your lessons more relevant to your students' lives is getting to know your students. So yes, part of this whole journey of interactive distance learning is that I get to know you. I seem to get a lot to know you, get to know you a lot through your emails um, and your interactions with me, but I'm looking forward to get to know you a lot. I see we've got quite a few that are on Gradebook already, so I'm going to chat to you about that now. But again, my information is what you need to know is my email address, because that's where you can hold of me for just about anything that you need to understand, or if you're querying anything, just send me a mail and I can get back to you. And don't forget, learning is fun, not only English, but it, all learning is fun and should be very exciting in your life as well. So I hope you're excited at the start of PGC. We'll look at that now as well. Remember your prescribed books um, is Van der Vault and Evans is your prescribed book, um, which is a 2019 edition. Um, recommended readings are always your CAPS documents, um, which I have uploaded under about this module on the Canvas page, so you can access your CAPS documents there. We will be going to CAPS all the time. And um, then Ferreira, which is this one, which was the previous um, prescribed reading, um, but we do refer to Ferreira a lot. So if you can get a copy of Ferreira, it's a good idea. And of course, Clean, um, which is it's suitable for whatever specializations you're doing. Um, it speaks about the CAPS document, it speaks about assessment, and so not only for English teaching, but across the board, you can use that for all teaching methodologies. Here they are, there's your CAPS document, that's what it looks like. There's Ferreira, there's Colleen, and yes, Van der Vault and Evans, which is your prescribed book. Okay, so let's just have a look at your model spreadsheet. Um, you'll see that I've got quiz one to quiz seven there. Um, I've got FETs, first additional language, FETs, home language, and SPs, home language here. You can see them all here. Um, if at the moment, 51 FETs um, have registered, 69 um, home language FETs, and 89 SPs have registered for this course. The quiz one and two, three, four, they're not for marks, they're not for participation as it was previously, but it is the little um, quizzes online um, at the end of every week, which I will upload which you can go and see how much you remember of the lesson. So it's a fun little quiz that you can do. And I'll let you know how many people have done it um, weekly. 
Um, if no one's doing it, um, I think it's a good idea to do this because it gives you a bit of an overview of what you're trying to cover in that week. And all relates to this lecture that I'm presenting. Okay, so this is for your revising section where you can go and check on what you should be learning. So just remember, it's not for marks. It's more for you. Just go and see what you understand of different things. So let's just have a look at the um, week one um, roundup. This is coming week week one. Um, the introduction and welcome recording has been uploaded along with the PowerPoint um, in Quick Links 1, okay, which is week one. Um, if you've clicked on that, I see many of you have. You will see all the little tasks that I've, I've put on there. I'll show you now what it looks like on the Canvas page. And the first question I asked you is how you're feeling. Um, if you look over there, that's if you go into Canvas, clicking on the homepage, Quick Links 1, you will see all the things that are happening this week. And amongst them is how you're feeling at the start of this week. It's the Kahoot quiz, which relates to the opening and welcome recording. And then there's the, the answer garden, where I've asked you to identify for FETs, um, two vocabulary activities to, to use to develop your vocab with your learners. Or if you SPs, I think it was two listening activities that I asked you to think of um, for listening class. And then you've got the online quiz task one, which is related to language teaching principles, which is what we're doing today. And then you'll see it right at the bottom of the quick links week one page. Um, you've got the CLT case study and reflections, which has already been uploaded. That's your first assignment that you have to submit. Um, and you'll do that by the 9th of April. If you are FETs, it's 11th of April, I think. If you are SPs or the other way around, I'm not sure, check the dates. And then also the week one language teaching principles, just click on those links and it'll take you to the, the, the 10 mark or the 10 multiple choice true false type questions. Okay, you've got to the 31st of March to do that anyway. And then I went and checked just now um, how many of you have done the mentee how are you feeling um, survey and I see two of you have done it um, this is for T-E-H-F-S um, so there's a combination here some of you are excited some of you are anxious I think that's the dichotomy that's what we're all feeling at this point when something is new it is a bit exciting but there's also a bit of anxiety attached to it so that's what I was expecting and I'm looking forward to seeing how others are feeling as well Just Click on the link and I'll be able to see that. This is the answer garden um, for F SPs. It is two activities to develop your listening. So just go there and type the two things. Um, 20 characters per word um, is what you've got. And then for FETs, list two activities to develop vocab, what you can think of. And this is what I will see when I will go into answer garden. This is for crossword puzzles. Um, I will see all the words that people have put in. The most things that people put in um, will be bigger font as well. So um, the way you can actually develop vocab is maybe through flashcards or crossword puzzles um, or hangman brainstorming, things like that. So put your what your activities are. I won't know who it is, so don't, there's no names attached. So just go and type and think of those activities. So um, this semester, we're going to have three units. Um, in the guidebook, it says topics, but the three units. First one is interrogating um, cats and then looking at teaching methodologies, which we're going to start looking at today, um, which is the principles for language learning. And if you go to Fanna Bolton Evans, it's in chapter one. And for us, I think it's chapter one and two. I'm not too sure. I can't see behind my face. Here. Let me just check here. I'm just going to move that. Yeah, chapter one and chapter one and two. And then we're going to get on to the other sections in the in the weeks ahead. Um, curriculum documents, we're going to look at the CAPS document next week. Then the methodologies, then um, looking at lesson plan development, especially as you're going to go on teaching practice, I think, in the second semester. And then you're going to look at assessment standards assessing. So what kind of teacher are you? This is going to be the first activity, really, to think about the kind of teacher that you are. This teacher looks like she's very friendly, she's opening, um, she's on the board. She's encouraging her students to talk. She's got a big smile on her face. So you can see she's enjoying herself. She's obviously doing something to do with past tense. I'm not too sure, but they've all got the ED and you can all see those the past tense words that she's busy dealing with. So if you go to Ferreira, I think it's, tap, it's um, page four. She has a list of 
qualities that would be effective as a language teacher. So I want you to go and have a look at those different qualities and think about what you think is important in a teacher. Think about three that you would choose. Um, I asked my granddaughter, who's now in grade eight, um, it's a first year at high school, and she says, fun teachers, she likes them. So there we go, you might tick that one. That it's a teacher that's warm and approachable with a sense of humor might be the kind of teacher you want to be or the kind of teacher you like. Oh yes, another one is quite interesting here, which I would tick, um, is consistent in manner, that means not changeable. So not one, one day you are mad or cross and the next day you're happy. Um, students know when they walk into your classroom that you're always happy or you're always cross. So just be consistent. Don't change um, as the weather changes. Just make sure you stay a consistent type of teacher. And you might say, well, I must be aware that there's language diversity in the class, that not all students are maybe mother tongue or first additional language students, maybe some with reading problems, maybe some of them are exceptionally gifted readers. Um, but look at all of these qualities and think about them. In activity task one, you're going to have to actually discuss these as well. Um, other ones that we've got here is that um, learners are interest, lessons are interesting to learners from various cultural groups. You've got to keep your lessons appropriate to the different cultural groups and socioeconomic levels. Um, be aware that students don't all have the same resources, so you can't expect them all to have the same things. Um, and also that there are different learning styles, and we will be covering those as well. So think which three you think are the most important. There they are in for page four. So um, in thinking about the kind of teacher you are, are you sort of an angry, frustrated, anxious type of teacher that's always overwhelmed? You get very cross very quickly. Or you're quite a miserable, tired, bored, sad, and apathetic type of teacher. And you obviously see that your learners, they fall asleep in your classroom. Um, you go on and on and on, very teacher-centered. And Lucy says to Charlie Brown, Psst, are you getting any of this? Okay, so teacher goes on, not even really being in touch with the students. Or are you this happy, joyful um, guide on the side, not sage on the stage type of teacher that you interact with your, teach your students, you actually let them come and work with you on the board, um, you let them peer teach, um, you have fun with them, and they are very much active and engaged in your classes. So that's the type of teacher I think we all like to be, having group work, not being, um, not being teacher centered all the time, but encouraging your students to be active in your classroom. So identify your teaching style, are you that lecturer? with everybody sitting in their own place, no group work, you talking with your hand up, okay? Or are you this type of person that encourages interaction in your class? You love it when there's a noise and you like it when students are working out things for themselves. Remember the teacher-centered classroom is not what we really must aim for, but rather the learner-centered type of classroom in our language class. So this is our lecture one, week one outline, we look at the CAPS learning outcomes, first of all, um, for semester one and semester two. Then we're going to go back to Ferreira, looking at page 18 to 22, which she discusses the language teaching and learning principles. Um, so that comes from that. And you'll see that there are seven of them, and we're going to go through them in this lecture. Um, teach language using text. That's not in isolation. So you don't just teach language out of nothing. You must have some kind of text, whether it's a textbook or it's a newspaper or it's a, if it's an article, you must use some kind of text. It could be a recording, it could be a video. You must teach skills in an integrated manner. That means you don't just teach only listening, but you'll teach a combination of talking, writing, and reading and listening together. So you will integrate all the skills together in your language class. You will read and view text critically. You will you will judge them and see what they are saying. Check the language use and not just accept everything um, because you love reading and you want to be critical of what you're reading and what you're sharing. Um, as a teacher, you need to mediate and scaffold learning. That means you need to support your learners. So that's very, very important as well. Um, Teach independent language learning strategies, for instance, speed reading strategies. Um, these are going to help your learners to sort of um, teach and become more efficient in the language and to develop their language learning pedagogically. Also, yes, as I said, be learner-centered, um, not teacher-centered, and use communicative language teaching approaches. That's mean you're going to use authentic 
situations in the classroom um, where you're going to develop their speaking skills and reading skills and writing skills. And then also to assess formatively, that means assess all the time and continuously, not only summative, which is at the end of a semester or a term. All right, so when do you assess? Okay. Um, first of all, let's look at the CAPS document. You're all going to have a copy. I told you it's, if you go and look on about this module on your Canvas pages, you'll see that there is your CAPS document for your specialization has been uploaded. And if you look at what um, the CAPS document says about language, I'm just going to take it, make it bigger here. Um, language is a tool for thought and communication. That's what we use language for. But more than that, language Learning to use a language is also important, very important because it enables learners to acquire knowledge if they've got, they can speak the language, to express their identity, who they are, their feelings, their ideas, to interact with others and to manage their world. So if they can use the language effectively, this is what they're able to do, this is what we must strive for in our classrooms. In addition, um, it is through language that cultural diversity our students from different cultures, social relations are expressed that we need language to do this and constructed. Um, and it's through language that such constructions can be altered, broadened and refined. So we can change perceptions of people through the words we use, the language we use, and we can integrate relationships just by the kind of inclusive language that we use. And this is important, we've been critical of language to use. So this all comes from the CAPS document, introducing languages, and this is what we think about in terms of the policy statements for, for use of language in our world, in our classroom. So if you look at the learning outcomes for languages in grades eight and nine, we're going to, in semester one, look at listening and speaking. And if you're SPs, you're basically looking at information and enjoyment um, when you're listening and speaking from a range of contexts. So, the focus is on information and enjoyment when you're listening and speaking. And then also in the semester, we look at reading and viewing. Um, that is our visual literacy. And again, we're going to read for enjoyment, view for enjoyment, as well as for information. So if you look at the advertisement, it's the information, but also to enjoy your actual advertisement. That's semester one. Semester two, we can look at writing, um, factual writing, as well as imaginative writing, if you grades, um, if you SPs. And then you're also going to look at, those of you who love grammar, uh, language structures and conventions. So how do we use sounds, words, and grammar to, to create and interpret text? And this all happens in semester two. So it's writing and critical grammar use and language use and contextualized grammar use, as well as assessment. We're going to look at that in semester two. FETs, a um, member for um, SPs, it's, it's information enjoyment. You also can look at listening and speaking, but this is for a variety of purposes, audience and context. So it's not only information and enjoyment, you can look at different kinds of listening and speaking, um, from formal speaking to informal speaking, from debating to presenting and so on. Also reading and viewing the same LOs, but with slightly more complexity, because it's for understanding and evaluating a range of texts and genres. And so we might look at poetry, we might look at drama, we might look at um, different kinds of essay writing, we might look at kinds of um, um, internet, websites, and all those kinds of different readings that we can do. And that's also for semester one. For um, semester two, we'll also again do looking at writing and presenting this is for a range of purposes, range of audiences, various conventions and formats from emails to narrative essays, to discursive essays, um, to designing advertisements, brochures, and things like that. And then also looking at language structures and conventions. Why do we use certain language conventions and certain language structures? Um, appropriately in a formal sense, in an informal sense, and that will all be part of semester two. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. For semester one, we're just looking at listening and speaking and reading. So those will be the genres we're going to look at. So let's go back to CAPS and think about thinking critically about things. What is that? Um, what is thinking and reasoning? We're going to put our thinking caps on and think about what we say, what we write, what we read, and be critical about it. So we look at the bit of caps now again. 
Um, and this is also the basis of what Ferreira on page 18 to 22 discusses um, with the different principles of English language teaching. So we can look at, I think it's six different things here. Um, what kinds of media can we use in our language classroom? Do we only use internet or can we use texts like newspapers, magazines, um, packaging, and so on? Um, there are the different texts we need to use, the media, um, what we can use, what visual material we will use in our classrooms, um, what is the structure or the form of the text that we're looking at, what are the language features there, what is the grammar that they are using, what is the vocabulary we use, and then what is the purpose and audience for each of those texts, who will read that, and why will they read it. So let's just go on with this and quickly look at the media forms, what different media forms there are. So you can bring all of these into your classroom as well, from print media, your books, magazines, and newspapers, to television and movies, your recordings, your video games, music, cell phones, software, internet, websites. These are all different kinds of media that you can use in the classroom. So it's not only the textbook that you need to use. Here's an example of an advertisement, which you could bring from the internet or from the magazine. Um, want a personalized bottle, share a Coke. Um, yeah, we'll look at the visual part of the, the Coke ad, the color, the font, um, the message, and so on. So those kinds of things to look in the grammar and the structure of it. Um, this was from a grade nine comprehension about um, an underwater hotel. Yes, you've got to think about your um, your student context here, where they come from, their background, sleeping with the fish. How many students there in your class will know what an underwater hotel is, let alone living under the water with the fish around them? Would they be interested in this? So is this kind of text relevant to them? It might be relevant to some students, but maybe not relevant to others because they couldn't understand why people would want to go to a hotel under the water, okay, under the sea, maybe to see the sharks, maybe, I'm not sure. Or what about selfies and phones and mobiles? I think most um, students or learners will relate to that. So any kind of thing I think to do with phones is something that will be relevant to them and something they'll be interested in it because they're all like their phones and um, looking at their screens all the time. What about cartoons? There's also another kind of text we can bring in, which is very important. It comes into the grammar papers, paper one and paper two. Um, where the visual is so important and we've got our elections coming up this year and then we've got Cyril um, with his promises and if you look at the fuel gauge um, with his sonar the state of the nation address um, empty is E so you have to understand all the symbolism of the cartoon and um, these promises they are at full tank okay but what about action you can see it the whole cartoon is based on the fact that there's an empty, um, lots of promises, not very much action. Um, and I think we're all used to this as well, but this is very really nice wrapped up in Suella cartoons. Right, so we've got number seven little tips for effective language teaching. The first one was um, looking at uh, text-based learning. This is going to be integrated language teaching. That means we're going to combine speaking, reading, listening, and writing. So let's look at a poem. For example, a poem called Me, Happy to be me. Um, blonde is my hair, eyes are blue. I'm 40 year, I wish I, I wish, years old and just the right size. No, not really. My name is Marcel and as you can see, I'm very happy to be me. So you can get them to do a little text or template poem like that. Um, but you try to integrate all the LOs when we're teaching the poem. So what does that actually mean? We're going to do something listening to someone, we're going to read the poem, and who's going to listen to the poem, maybe speak the poem, do their own little poem and speak about it, read poems, write poems. So those are all things that can be integrated. But what about the language side of it? How could we include language in that? Here's another poem about me. This is me. Um, I'm as colorful as a rainbow. I'm as cute as liguerish. I'm as fast as a cheetah. I'm totally cool and amazing. I'm as tall as a tree by either. So we could look at that. Um, I'm as cute as, and which is your simile, where's your language structure, um, how you can use it in a poem. What about vocabularies? What is liguerish? Okay, so to think about things like that. 
What about cool, the use of slang words, um, informal language, you could bring that into it. And then I'm as tall as a tree, the alliteration there. So there are so many things of language that you can bring into this. What about the tense that has been used? What about complexity of sentences? Are there simple sentences? Um, this, the repetition that's coming up in this. So lots of things you could use, which is based on a text to integrate so much into the teaching of something like a poem. Oh, what about onomatopoeia? What is that? Here's some definitions or words that are onomatopoeia, mumble, gurgle, splash, bam, belch. Yes, it's a word, type of word that sounds like something it's describing. So if they boom, okay, or whoosh, or buzz, um, the word sounds like you hear it. And there's a whole lot of comic words we see all the time in cartoons, bang, zap, poof, pop, lol, crash, okay. So when onomatopoeia attacks, owl, eek, oosh, pop, bam. When someone's fighting, those are the words that you can imagine. Comes lots in Garfield cartoons. Um, uh, o, O, D, an apology in frame one. And push, he fall, pushes him off the counter and crash, he falls there. All right. And here's another one from Garfield. There's squish, there's thump, 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 and there's boink. Um, all the words that we can use with the onomatopoeia. He has lots of examples, crash, whack, thump, um, lots of nice sound words that you could use in the class and ask him to develop their own sound effects as well. Um, number three um, principle is critically aware of the language you use. Are we using inclusive language? Are we using social justice language? Are we, are we excluding people? Or we should, when we should be including people in the words we use. So we're going to look. The National Curriculum Statement for Languages says you have to be very aware and critically aware of the language that you use. Um, and what does that mean if we are to engage critically with text? We must realize that sometimes we have to challenge ideas, what people have written about, their perspectives, their values, and their power relationships. We can't always just accept everything that we read about. And um, we've got to express opinions um, on ethical issues and values. What do we think about it? To, to explain answers are so important that you learn to, to express your opinions. Because all texts carry values. You might not think it, but they all do. Um, it can be negative words, negative values like sexist language, racist language, autocratic judgmental, where they write about women, about things, or positive, um, democratic, fair, caring, compassionate. Just think of the word laughing okay words that we can use to describe that we can say snigger and that just means you're being quite rude and horrible if someone's saying something and we snigger at it it means it's not something very positive they're reacting to it or we can have a look at another word here is smoke okay that means you also don't really agree with them and you've been very critical of what they are saying that's a type of smile or you can laugh and chuckle okay which is more positive grin and um, jest is also Bit negative, but it's fine. Um, so these are words that you can use to either show positivity or negativity towards someone. So identify what values are being expressed in something. How are they expressing those values? And how does language empower people or how does it disempower people? So you've got to be critical of that all the time. So just think about this. Have you ever felt excluded by language? I think sometimes when people use, use words that you don't understand or jargon that you don't understand, you can feel a bit excluded in the conversation or another language in front of you. So you can feel excluded by language, but visually you can also see the contrast here when you see UFS welcomes you and you can see that the gates are locked and you're not really welcomed in. So to thinking about language and social justice when you're teaching language is to make our students aware how words can actually disempower or how they can include others and dis dis not include others. So when we greet others, be very careful of the words you use. So if you use words like ladies and gentlemen, ma'am, sir, girls, guys, we should avoid them rather and say thanks friends, good morning folks, um, and for you, can I get you all something so you you make it more inclusive rather than exclusive. Um, so you've got to be very mindful of the language that we use. If you use a lot of pronouns like you, hers, they, everyone, him, and them, 
it means you, you're othering, you are not including them in what you're speaking about. Me, my, our is more inclusive, but all those pronouns mean you are pushing people away. You're being exclusive, you're not including them. So we've got to try and be very inclusive in the language you use. Um, and this is a definition of what non-inclusive language is. It's any language that treats people unfairly, insults, or excludes a person or group of persons. So we must be very careful of using the they and the them and you, um, because that pushes people away. So that's been critical of language. Yes, as teachers, we've got to mediate and scaffold. That means support our students. So when learning is supported, guided, um, it has been mediated. It's like the scaffolding of a building to make sure it doesn't fall down. Um, and teachers can do this by bringing models and examples into the classroom, like advertisements, asking questions to get students involved, giving guidance on how to interpret something, giving criteria, which is your rubrics, showing them how you're going to evaluate something, giving them, um, helping them find the key points in something, making lists, reading instructions. Um, and then once the students can work independently, then your scaffolding can be taken away, but you must first help them along with that. So what we've got here is you model as a teacher right at the bottom, then you guide, mostly the teacher, then you gradually release. It's also called the gradual release model, mostly the students, and then independent, ultimately, where it's all about the student doing it themselves. But they will start with a supportive structure and gradually through the tasks that they do, they will do their independent writing at the end, maybe. So let's just think about what strategies you could give your learners to develop vocab or be active listeners. This takes us back to the, the answer garden um, task that you've got on picking swan um what two voc activities could you use to develop vocab this should be fets not sps okay i made a mistake there so fets what two activities would you use to develop vocab and the fets um you would draw you would do the vocab and the sps would do the listening okay so um i'll fix this up on the on the powerpoint for upload Okay, so those are your answer garden tasks. You go to the answer garden. This is what I'm going to see eventually. This is what makes you happy. Yours has got to be about how do you teach vocab or active listening. And there we've got good coffee. Walk, walk somewhere and it smells lovely. It's sunshine. Um, it's something that makes you feel good. Holidays make us feel good. What about teaching? It should make you feel good as well. All right. Right, number five, remember the seven of these, strategies for learning. Um, how can we help learners to develop strategies to become better without the teacher constantly supporting them, without constantly mediating, without constantly scaffolding? What can we give, teach them? And what we can do is teach them how to read in a fast way, speed reading strategies. And that means how do we look at different texts? And this could be skimming. Um, which means you go and look at all the headlines and the main ideas, or you scan. This is when you're looking for one word in a dictionary or you're reading instructions carefully. You go and look for words. Scanning is the fastest kind of um, reading technique we can use. And as you can see, we don't use full reading for everything. We have got to learn that sometimes you've got to skim, sometimes you've got to scan, sometimes you've got to survey the text before we go into more intensive reading. And then also check our reading speeds, okay? Um, if you read very slowly, you're going to fall asleep and you won't understand the message. So there are two um, reference or two links here that you can go and try and find out what is your reading speed. Um, it's a w.readingoft and spreader.com where you can go and check your reading speed or go anywhere on Google and check your reading speed. So if you have a look at these different speeds, um, if you're reading at 200 words a minute, um, on paper, you you read a lot slower. You read, with well, no, faster, sorry, 240 words a minute, but on the screen, you read 200 words a minute, which is a lot slower, and you would have 60% comprehension, and that would make you an average reader. On a screen, if you're reading at 300 words a minute, which is what you should be doing as a, um, a graduate and postgraduate student, um, which is 400 words a minute on paper, that means you can have 80% comprehension, and that means you are a good reader. So you can see the faster you read, the more you can comprehend, 
and the better reader you are. If you read very slowly, like 110 words a minute, you're only going to understand 50% what you're reading, which is insufficient. Okay, so reading speeds are very, very important because you have to read quickly to actually comprehend what you're reading. So also um, scanning, you can look at content pages, indexes, reference books, library catalog, keywords, and these are things that can help you improve your reading speed. Okay, those of you that read like this. Okay, some people read like that. Or do you read like this? Okay, and that's going to make you bored and slow and you're not going to be able to comprehend it. So remember, speed reading is important for good reading. Reading complexity, remember, it's not easy to read. Some people really battle with reading. So adults, um, their reading speed is between 200 and 250 word a minute, words a minute. And that's very an average speaker, speed reader. Um, whereas college students where you are should be at least 300 to 400 words a minute. Remember, you read slow on screens and you do on paper. Um, so just check your, your screen reading and your paper reading as well. So when you speak, um, 160 words a minute. Um, if people speak slower than that, you can get irritated and bored. But if they speak 180 to 200 words a minute, it's a bit fast and you might not understand what they are saying. However, we think at far faster than we are reading or we speaking, we, we think at 1,000 a, a to 3,000 words a minute. So that means when I'm reading this, you're already daydreaming, you're planning menus, and you're arguing with what I'm saying. Okay, so that means you've got lots of time to do that. So the brain comprehends everything before the person's even said it. Isn't that amazing? So we lose a lot of time because... People are speaking slowly, reading slowly, and the brain is comprehending and maybe getting very bored and wanting to fall asleep. But reading is also complex because there's different sounds and different words, and you've got to have different combinations of letters, and you've got to sort out the new from the unfamiliar, and then you've got to associate the sounds, the letters, and if you can't do that, you aren't going to be able to read very well. So this goes right back to grade one. If you don't know sounds, you don't know letters, you can't combine, up, combine them, you are trying to sound out everything that's going to slow down your reading pace phenomenally. Um, when we get onto the reading section in about four weeks' time, we will go through these reading speeds and think about a bit more. Abeja, okay, think about that combination of letters. You've got a Q there, you've got an H there. Um, Gaburha, okay, if you try to say that like a South African would say, who's not from... Um, this country, whereas we know that the Q sound is a click, and so the H sound is a rough sound, a bear ha, okay, how we would say it. So very difficult to, to, word to say, especially if you don't know the sound, um, you try and say it in your own language, which doesn't perhaps have those sounds. Afrikaans is also typical, Roy Royce, I always battle with that because it's a it's very guttural sound, and some people can't use that because they, their language doesn't have that. So number six, remember we've got another one to go. We've got to be learner-centered in our classrooms. And that's why we strive for communicative language teaching approaches, because this is a very learner-centered approach. Um, CLT is an approach which, in the classroom you use, you get your students to convey ideas and meaning. And you don't worry how accurate or correct the language is, as long as they can do say what they are saying meaningfully. Okay, so as you might have noticed, I have had a few little blops as I've tried to speak, but if you can get the gist of what I'm saying and understand that, that's fine. It's communicative. So it's in the classroom. You don't stop your learners all the time because they may have made an error in the pronunciation. If the class is understanding or their partner is understanding, that is fine. You're encouraging them to speak in the target language and you're giving them a reason to do so. And that's what all communicative language teaching is. doesn't matter if you're first language or first additional language, you should allow your teachers, your students to speak in the class um, so they can use the target language. So you using CLT, you're going to emphasize using language for appropriate communication, to ask questions, to conduct a survey, to um, role play, have a dialogue with somebody, follow instructions, and so on. Various contexts, as I said, from maybe interview situation to a drama situation to poetry situation, different tasks they might have to use language for, and social interaction because they're going to be speaking to each other. And the teachers are not going to do all the speaking. 
So I just go on to the next section here. So in all of this, you've got to give your learners reasons to communicate. Okay, so they don't just do it. You're going to have to give it to them. So you must provide a lot of opportunities for them to practice using the target language by giving them reasons to communicate. Um, for instance, you go around the class and you say, I feel so frustrated when, um, when I don't get full marks. Okay, give them all a chance to answer the question. Um, I was happy today because, okay, so that kind of filling the gap um, gives them a chance to speak. The other nice one using a, a cell phone, um, texting, a movie starts at nine. Can you drive us? What does the person answer? Yeah, be there by 10.30. What is the feedback? So the sender, the receiver, the medium, the message, get them to give dialogues and to complete something. Um, you could do this by passing a message around the classroom where a person can ask a question, then the next one can answer it, then ask the next question. And you can do this as a sort of movement around the class. We all give it a chance to add something to it. These are um, different activity types, um, information gap activities, where you don't know what to write in there. You've got to put an answer into something. Um, information gathering activities is like getting information, a survey, asking people questions, learners questions, and they've got to then write a report. Um, they've got to share opinions about different pieces of um, not a novel they may have read, a short story they may have read. Why did you like the hero? Why didn't you like the hero? What was the best part? What was not the best part? Um, let them express their opinions. I mean, this is part of critical thinking as well. Finally, formative and summative assessment. Okay. I remember summative is at the end of the course. It's your exams at the end of the semester or end of the term, end of the year. And this enables the teacher to draw conclusions about your learners, their knowledge, their understanding and their skills. Also, after your assignments this semester, We'll also be able to determine different things about you. What do you understand? Um, purpose of this, purpose of summative assessment is, all right, let's see how much you remember. Okay, so it's that kind of end of term type of assessment. And because we do at the end of a course, um, this is, it often has limited value as you can't use this information to help your learners to learn anything more. They have failed or they have passed. You're not going to now go and do a, a revision exercise of what they know or they don't know. It's the result is at the end. So we've got um, formative, which is to improve the learning because you can use the feedback to develop the learning. But summative is to grade your students at the end of your course. So the best way to develop our students' understanding and their knowledge is to give formative, formative, formative to end with the final assessment, the summative assessment at the end. Right, so what about the um, TFF and THFS 701 assessments? What about them? As I've said, I think I said this in the opening and welcome as well. Um, we've got unit one, unit two, unit three, um, and each one has got an assessment. Your first one is on a CLT, communicative language teaching case study, which you're going to answer questions on. But then you're also going to write reflections about your te teaching methodologies and your understanding of PGCE. And that's due for the 9th and 11th of April, and it counts 30%. You're going to upload it on Turnitin on the, on the link um, that you'll see on, on Quick Links 1. Um, go to where the essay the assignment is, click on that, and that's where you're going to upload it. Um, in Unit 2, which is the listening and speaking, you're going to develop a, a lesson plan. Speaking is going to be for FETs. Listening is going to be for SPs. I'm using a CLT, Communicative Language Teaching Approach, but you'll also do a six-minute video recording of what your introduction will sound like. Okay, so it's going to be a lesson plan, which is going to go up on Trinidad, but it's also going to be a recording that you're going to upload onto SpeedGrader. And then finally, um, Unit 3, which is our genre and reading um, section of the semester, you're going to do a workshop presentation. So it's going to be a 20-minute presentation that you're going to give to, to teachers on how to teach genre. Okay, that'll be 45%. Actually, I think it's 35%. I must change that percentage. It's 30, 35, and 35, which gives 100%. Okay, right. So hang in for the 9th and 11th of April. What's next? Um, this is a good, this little cartoon. There we got um, Stripes there. He's been teaching him how to whistle 
And in the first um, frame, it says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. And then his friend says, I don't hear him whistling. And he says, I said, I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. So we can teach our students many things, not to say they are going to learn it. So remember, enjoy and enjoy your teaching. And then next week, we'll look at the, um, to interrogate the curriculum statement, the CAPS document, and learn more about that. Okay, so I hope you have a good first week. I hope you're all registered and raring to go. If you have any issues or problems, please get back to me on email. Um, but otherwise, I take it. Everything's going fine. And I'm excited to be spending this semester and year with many of you. Okay, take care. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And we'll chat soon. Bye for now.